it's the Halloween season. And we are going to talk about ghosts, goblins, mysteries, hauntings. And we have a returning guest. We have Jeff Belanger, not only talking about his latest book, The Call of Kilimanjaro, but we're going to dive in some of his other books, such as Who's Haunting the White House, The World's Most Haunted Places, Ghost of War, and The Ghost Files. I mean, the list goes on and on with many of his books. We can't get enough because everyone has a story. As UFO stories, everybody has a ghost story. And today on Truth Be Told, we are going to get into the spirit world. I'm Tony Sweet, and please welcome to Truth Be Told, the one and only Jeff Belanger. What's going on? Thank you, Tony. Good to see you again. You... I think last time I didn't get to see you. Now I can see you. I know. It's it's a disappointment. I, I know. But it's okay. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've seen worse when some with some of the spirits. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look great. You uh, look great. Thank so you, it's great to be you. here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have you back. And we were talking beforehand, and he, he let me have it, saying, why is it only October that... Uh, Jeff is on the show. Well, now I'm going to make an point that you're definitely going to come back in March for the book release of That'd be great. But yeah. uh but yeah, I I mean this this time of year, you know, the the spirits are awake and well, they're always awake, but uh, I think these people are more aware of it because we're getting ready for Halloween. <laughs> and that's a tradition that goes back thousands of years. You know, it's uh November 1st is one of the eight major holidays all around the world, right? So that there's four big ones, and those are the solstices and the equinoxes, the world over, because right. these are holidays dictated by the sun and stars and the position of the earth. It's, it's an exact moment. But halfway between each one, the half holidays are also significant. And this one, Samhain, coming up November 1st, uh, is a time the Celtic people told us the veil huh. between the world of the living and world of the dead is at its thinnest and ghosts and monsters and imps and fairies come into our world and meddle in our affairs. Whether it's true or not, we've had that drilled into us for thousands of years and we're not, and that's not the only culture, right? Dia de los Muertos, uh, first (laughs) couple days in November and and Spanish cultures and Mexico and things like that. So the world over, we're thinking about ghosts by the end of October and that's just turned into the second biggest consumer holiday behind Christmas. Well done, everyone. I'll, Give yourselves I'll, a round of applause yeah. for that. Well, you know what? I, we, I might as well because we have this we have this cheesy canned applause, so we might as well we might would, as well add it. It's a good thing I don't have control of that because it would just be on the whole time. Yeah, every so. every, every other word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, we because you know we do a lot of UFO shows also throughout the year, and we we talk to a lot of people. We go to UFO. Oh, ufo conferences and everybody has a ufo story i mean they may not admit it at first they said well this one time yeah this happened but the same with ghost stories yeah um i i I don't know why people still have this like fear of telling their story i don't know if they think people are going to think they're crazy or or what it is but you know i had a story i'm sure you've had a story before you even started doing this book writing books and research is that right oh yeah sure so i grew up around it you know you growing up in old new england i had friends whose old houses were haunted and i thought wow what do you mean haunted is it like blood coming out of the walls and your head spins around like no just some old guy lives here and then he disappears and that was it and i went well that's really strange and so we'd break out the ouija board and try to make contact. I also grew up in the town next to Ed and Lorraine Warren. So from the That's Conjuring right. and the oh, Annabelle movies yeah, and all that stuff, like those yeah. were their cases. So I knew them since I was 12. So I was kind of steeped in this stuff, just grew up around it and intrigued. And and I get it. And, and once, by the way, once you start going down the rabbit hole, I, why stop, right? So I have had a UFO encounter as well. I'm oh. also interested in cryptids. I'm interested in uh, time travel. I'm interested in everything weird and fringe because at some point, right in for a penny in for a pound, um, like, right. let's look at everything. I, I don't want to, I don't want to look at just one thing and, and not another. I, I remember talking to a, a, um, a MUFON researcher in mm-hmm. Illinois, and he was telling me this story about how they were working on a case, interviewing people, really compelling. And then the people said, Oh, by the way, we think our house is haunted. <laughs> and, and and he said, oh, it was like someone farted in the car. And like, oh, we're out of here. You know? And you go, really? Like, that's the line? Like, right. you're here for one thing and one thing only and nothing else can exist. And so I'm of the opinion, the story to me is the most compelling thing. 
we can argue about what's behind the story, but the story itself exists. And that's the thing we chase, whether you're chasing a UFO story or a ghost story or a cryptid story, whatever. It starts with a story that you found compelling enough that you were willing to go look for it. I think we've talked about this before, about how ghost, Bigfoot, UFOs are a lot of very similar stories. And and sometimes I think there's possibility even a tie-in with every single one of those Um, i agree because other dimensions i mean how do we know that aliens aren't ghosts and ghosts aren't aliens in some in some way i agree i i I think there's the the universe uh, you know to borrow a phrase right is weirder than we can understand right and we don't have all the answers and i understand how uh, we live in a time when we're, we're certain about so much and yet this post-truth society we find ourselves in now which is so troubling so very very troubling uh opinion now is just as good as fact (laughs) wherever you stand i'm not going to weigh in on on politics but it's just everybody's opinion now is is, as good as facts and i i on the one hand i sort of get it right we've been moving toward that um you can't argue with people when you're talking about their religion right no this is true it's my truth there's there's no other you can't argue with people when you're talking about their politics for the same reason and I feel like those of us in the paranormal, we've been navigating these waters long before it got weird right. <laughs> in mainstream <laughs> politics, right? right. Like we've, right. Been, we've been piloting ships through these seas, like follow <laughs> us. We know what we're doing, right? Because we, ha- we, we, we deal in uh, belief and, and, and religion and spirituality, like all of that stuff kind of comes together in this big gumbo uh, where we work. And um, I feel like the world could learn a lot from us. Don't you tell <laughs> I, I, I keep telling them. They don't listen, but they, I keep telling them, damn it. Right. Uh, well, you know, the, the latest book, uh, The World, I mean, The World's Most Haunted Places, this book can be reoccurring over and over because there's so many different haunted places <laughs> around the world. I think yeah. you have series probably, you know, 480 second by the, you know, by the end of your life because, you know, this world is old. And even humankind is old and paranormal has been here since day one. Sure. Uh, what what made you want to branch out? And because, you know, there's so many things, like you said, around where you grew up, there's so many places on the East Coast that you could spend your rest of your life researching. Why did yeah, you branch so- out to the world's most haunted? Well, believe it or not, I started with the world. Like that, my first book, that's actually the second uh, edition of my first book. Put so, me in my place. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, no, no. And, and so kidding. I started with the world because I fell into the trap in my younger foolish years that all the cool stories are somewhere else, somewhere far, far away. And it's easy to fall into that trap. And you forget that wherever you live, wherever that may be, is far, far away from someone else. Right. And so uh, in, in more recent years, I've really turned to looking at New England because this is home, because it's very accessible to me. I can, I can drive there. I can, I can check things out. Um, I started a, a TV series called New England Legends and a weekly podcast called New England Legends where I just explore weird fringe stories. And we throw it all on the table. We've done UFOs. We've done many cryptids. We've done ghosts. And we've done just like plain odd history. Um, so as I'm moving forward, I'm finding that I, I want to get, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to, to scratch the surface of a bunch of stories. Right. And it's another to go in deeper to <laughs> fewer. And I'm finding that's more interesting to me as I move on in my career, that, that I want more details. I want to really get into the meat of it. And um, so uh, anyway, I think I've totally danced off your question of the world's most haunted places. But uh, oh, at sorry. the same time, <laughs> there are very cool places far away from us as well. I'm not saying that's not true at all, but um, that but that's where it started. It's just like, how exotic can we be? Where can we look? And how far away can we go? And man, I've been to Australia looking for mm. ghosts. I've been to Europe. I've been to Africa. I've been to Canada, all over the U.S. And I, I think that uh, one thing that I found universally true is that there's an understanding of what a ghost is on every continent and in every culture, well, even if we don't agree with what it is, but we know what we're talking about. So, I mean, I, I work with a lot of psychic mediums, uh, empaths, healers, uh, but in the ghost world, you hear ghost spirits, demons, goblins. I mean, we hear all these different types and people are like, what's, what's the freaking difference? 
<laughs> and you and your in your in your research, have you ran into different types of where you would consider a demon or possession? That is that just because people are confused, and I maybe yeah, you can explain. I get it. it. I get it. And you know what? And let, uh, allow me to uh, be a little mea culpa here on adding to some of the confusion. I tend to <laughs> use the word ghost and spirit uh, interchangeably right? because I like to vary my word choice. That's the writer in me. Um, I guess if you were a purist, a spirit, if you were really going like hardcore definition, and I'm not a psychic medium or anything like that, but a spirit might be like the definition of an interactive intelligent entity. For example, grandma died two months ago and she's standing before you and said, Hey, I hid some money in my pillowcase. <laughs> Don't throw it away. Right. right? So spirit uh, ghost would be more like the uh, movie that plays over and over again. It was there at one point, but it's not there now, but some ah. people kind of pick up on that movie. Right. Demon would be something that was never human. Um, and now you're, you're really getting into belief system, religious belief system, when you're talking about demons, because you have to believe that there is an evil force uh, that has these monsters that are literally here just to hurt us. Um, I have not encountered what I would call a demon. However, I have worked on haunting stories related to people like Jeffrey Dahmer and son of Sam Berkowitz and hmm. uh, folks that... Uh, that conducted themselves in ways that was purely evil. And if you would like to label the Adolf Hitlers of the world as demons or the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world as demons, I won't argue with you. I mean, that's as, that's as good a label for them as any other. Um, but I have not encountered what I believe to be a creature that's just pure evil looking to hurt me. Um, I've encountered stuff that I think is, is more human nature. And just as there are good people, there are bad people and the rest of us are somewhere in between. Did you ask about anything else? Was it goblins? I don't know. What, what did we what it, Whatever. You know what I'm saying. It's yeah. just that the everybody other. has, it's, you know, it's like Bigfoot, Sasquatch, bottom of yeah. snow. I mean, there's different different terms, but uh, in the spirit world, there are different meanings. Um, so al allow me to also, Mia Culpa, I wrote yep. an entire book trying to answer the question, um, what is a ghost? I wrote a whole book about it. And I'm not even going to say the title in case someone bought it, bought it and wants a refund. <laughs> no refunds. So, uh, I, I, allow me though to turn that whole book into like one sentence for you, right? Okay. A ghost is history demanding to be remembered. That's it. It could have, I could have fit that whole thing on just a bumper sticker. <laughs> it's just the past coming to the present. That's what a ghost is. Period. Uh, because when when we're talking about uh, events from the past that that still keep coming up, that haunts us. For example. Uh, like the Lizzie Borden house in Fall River, Massachusetts. Right. Two, per two people were murdered inside that house and no one was ever punished for that crime. That's just a fact. And that haunts us, <laughs> right? In Amityville, uh, Long Island, six people were murdered by their brother slash son. And though he was caught and he is in jail to this day, it's such an atrocious, horrible act that haunts us mm. because we know it could happen again. It ha does happen, right? We right. hear stories, horrible stories of the evil that people can do to each other. And so those kind of things haunt us. We keep talking about it. We get scared because we don't want to be the victim. We don't want it to happen to us. We don't want it to happen to people we care about. And that's the mm. power of the ghostly legend part of it. I personally believe there is a paranormal element to it, a catalyst. But if nothing else, there's a story. And listen, I, I like I said, I've worked with some of the top psychics in the world. I I believe in this stuff. You know, I, I, even as a kid, I you know I saw my own ghost and spirit in my house I grew up with. My nephew saw it years later at about the same age. We were kids. You know, I was a kid. But a lot of psychics say, oh, you know, tell the spirit you're not welcome here. It's you can go to the light or whatever else. But I'm thinking, but that's the fun part about. You know, having the stories, why would I want to? <laughs> why would I want to stop that spirit from you know staying here and giving us something to talk about? But maybe they get the story first. The only thing, you know, let me address that because, and I know I'm friendly with some of the psychics too, and so right. on. And look, I've never found a place that's haunted all the time. Right. True. Never have. If it was, I would buy it, and Tony, I would charge you out the nose to come see it. <laughs> I just would. I'd be like, there's the ghost, always there. Open the door, wave, there. Right. There's your ghost experience guaranteed. This stuff does not appear on cue, at least not in my 25 years of experience. So 
to say I would clear it or send it on its way, it's not always there right. or, or I don't see it or, or people aren't always experiencing it. So how can I send it on its way? What power do I have? I could suggest that, but man, nine times out of 10, it comes back. I mean, right. you hear about it again. This place is clear. And then weeks later, the family says, it's not. I still have ghosts. I was going to ask you about that. As, as if, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the, the story continues, right? And, and I, I believe personally, this is my own crazy theory. I believe we summon them. And, and I don't mean I in some like it. witchy, esoteric, like cauldron kind of way. Right. I mean, when you walk into a place, allow me to turn that off. Is a pizza delivery ready? or <laughs> I, The pizza's here, man. You can wait. Um, so when you walk into a place and you understand the, the history of, of what took place there, and you start thinking about the people that maybe were murdered there, or people right. who lived there, or who suffered there, or whatever, you're literally calling them up right? You are, you're pulling their energy into your brain and into the present. You are summoning them. There must be some reason. Ghosts only go back like, I don't know, 150 years, 200 years. Beyond that, we don't hear about them so much. And the reason is we're not connected to them. Mm. We don't talk too much about ghosts from a thousand years ago because we just, they're too abstract that we don't, right. we don't have good names and and, and places and people that, that connect us to it. But Civil War, we can say, oh man, my great, great, great grandfather was in the Civil War. And this picture hung on my grandfather's mantle when I was a kid. And, and like, we're still connected to that. And my That's gosh, right. more than ever, we need, the, we need the Civil War to haunt us, don't we? Right. I mean, especially today. <laughs> right, we need, for sure. We to, need to remember how bad it can get. And, um, and so I think we summon those spirits. And so someone can come in and say, forget about it. They're gone. They're on. They're, they're gone to the light. And you go, okay, yeah, they're, they're gone to the light. And you stop thinking about them for a couple of weeks. And then you go, but I wonder, are they really? And right. you just call them back and here they I, are. I believe that. I believe that. And well, that's what makes sense to me. Well, well in your travels, you know, uh, the world's most haunted places, where did you find that some of the most active places? I know here in California, the Queen Mary is sure. very active. I I'm trying to actually be, right before COVID, I was I got approved to go and film and do some interviews there, and of course then COVID happened and that changed that. So hope, hopefully after it's over, I can get out there. But where where are some of the places that you actually seen, not just heard, but seen activity the most around the places that you've you've done your research? Yeah, so it doesn't happen for me very often, mm -hmm. but when it does, I never ever forget it. Uh, the first time I really saw what I thought was a ghost was in Paris, France. Uh, I was in the catacombs. Oh, really? Paris. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And this was 2003. I'd already been writing about ghosts for years at this point. Um, and not that I disbelieved. And I had experiences that I would say are kind of like more spiritual. Right. But I can't tell you like that's a ghost. I could just say like, wow, I felt something, sensed something. But in this case, I was 30 meters below the city walking through tunnels surrounded by millions of human skeletons. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> uh, suddenly in this long straightaway, I stopped because I see this shadow, the size of a man move from the right side to the left and go back again. And I just went, okay, wait a minute. Now the tunnel's narrow enough that my fingertips would touch skulls on both sides. Right. No one came from behind me. And then I thought, okay, maybe there's like a little side tunnel up there or something. And nope, it's just a long straightaway. And I went, all right, if that's not a ghost, I, I don't have another word for it. And, and, and in that moment, I thought about the hundreds of people that I had interviewed about their ghost experiences. And I said, all right, well, shoot, they're like me, right? I was just in this place. I wasn't summoning or looking or thinking or anything. And then it just happened. It's like, it's like a lightning strike, right? You, sometimes you're there when lightning strikes. And I think that's what happened to me. And I, I'll never forget it. It took days, weeks, months to sink in, like what it means and what it means for me, what it means for, for my own sense of spirituality, which is a definition that's getting added to and reworked every day that I, I live. Uh, but that moment was just such a game changer for me. And I went mm. back, by the way, years later, I went back to those catacombs and I was down there with my wife and I said, look, this is where it happened. Let's go. And I stood there and I'm like, I'm ready. It's, it's me. It's Jeff. I'm back. Let's go. <laughs> right? And action. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing She's that like, second uh -huh, time. Sure. <laughs> yeah, just crickets. Like, oh. She okay. was like, did you go drinking before you came? <laughs> no, it was 10 in the morning. And that's a fair question, by the way. I take right, no insult. Right. Uh, the first time I went, it was 10 in the morning, sound mind and body. I had a free day. 
in Paris. And, um, and that's, that's where I went. Other people were going to the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay. I'm going underground. Yeah. I, cause a lot of people ask, you know, is they think of cemeteries, they always think of cemeteries being the most active, but actually, you know, battlegrounds, um, I couldn't even imagine like Normandy. Did you ever have a chance to go to Normandy or talk to anybody about Normandy or battle, big battles like that over overseas? Yeah, so my my grandfather, uh, my mother's father, stormed the the beaches. Really? Of, of, yeah, he wow. was he was not in the first wave, but he was in like the the Probably days good. after, as as more troops kept funneling in. Um, he was there, and you know, lost friends. I remember him telling me stories about uh, my grandfather. Man, he had the best attitude. He told me stories about how he's racing through France, and the guy in front of him is gunned down and killed. The guy yeah. behind him is gunned down and killed, and he's untouched. And he said, I always figured there must be some reason for that. And he just lived every day of his life like, this is amazing. Like every sandwich he ate was just like, this is awesome. You know, like everything was just awesome. Right. And, um, and, and, and I remember hearing those stories as a kid. It just, and, and thinking like, I can't imagine people around me getting okay. gunned down and no bullets touch me. And that's, um, you know, you wonder, guardian angels, not your time, dumb luck, right. random chance use whatever label you want, but that creates a powerful emotion to that place. Oh so if God, you yeah. go to Normandy, if you go to those beaches and you know what happened there, I think it's pretty easy to put yourself in that place. Though I have not been to Normandy, I have been to like Gettysburg uh, multiple times. And when you stand and say Devil's Den mm -hmm. and you realize there were people that were told, you know, hey, at 930, we're charging that hill. And you know, like if you're if you're waiting behind a rock or whatever, you know, at nine thirty and ten seconds, you're going to die. There's no way, <laughs> right. no, because everyone before you didn't make it up the hill. You're not either, um, but you're going to do as you're told because you're going to try and you're going imagine. to die in minutes. And that must the fear, the angst, like all those human emotions. I think they just soak into the earth. And if you're another fellow human being, you tune into it. And I just call that empathy. I don't even call it psychic. I just call that regular empathy. And I mean, if like everything, everything has an energy and energy never dies. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's the same thing. There's there was an energy that was embedded there. And I, I'm considering myself an empath. And I, you know, it's like it's like, it's like when you get the, the goosebumps, that type of thing, that's an energy. So it's like you, know, sure. if you take a magnet or something that lifts your hair it's the same thing it's it's uh it's some type of energy so um well, let's, well, let's stay on empath for one second okay so that's talking about getting feelings when you go to places how about when you go to visit like family or friends and you walk in and you just go oh something's wrong right are you okay like are right. you see you're sad i can tell that you are sad that is empathy right and we all and you sh if you don't experience that and some people don't by the way and there's a word for it and that word is psychopath <laughs> like no it's true right. if you feel no, no right. human empathy then that's trouble right you should be able to pick up on the emotions of other living people and if you can pick up on other living people then why not people that were there before mm. uh you said you you did some traveling and you went to australia give us some of the places in australia cuz you know here in america we don't really hear much about the australian uh haunted most haunted places so give us a couple yeah. places down there so the I, I got to go to Manning uh, Quarantine Station, and this place was brutal. Right outside of Sydney, this is where uh, this was like their Ellis Island. You know, when when immigrants were coming to Australia, they had to go through the Manning Quarantine Station, and they were just the the Aussies were brutal. Hey, did you just sneeze? Get in the room, right? Oh you're not God. you're not going onto the mainland until we're sure you're not sick, and they put you in a room full of people that might have yellow fever or all kinds of other stuff. So you could have just had a cold before and now you're in the room with yellow fever and, you know, you're going to get that. Hmm. So they they would separate families. People died by the truckload on this island um, because they didn't want any sick, strange diseases coming into the country. And you can still walk around the old barracks, the old bunkhouses and things like that. And this is just one of those places where, again, when you know the story, when you know the history, you could just imagine like being pulled away from your parents or your kids pulled away from you and thrown into one of these rooms because they're sick wow. and you may never see them again. And what that must feel like that those emotions, you just, ugh, it, it just tears your heart out. 
Um, to me, that's the big one because that's literally the gateway to Australia was the, the Manning quarantine station. Um, also got to go to a jail, uh, an old jail up north of Sydney. And, um, you know, a, a jail's a jail. I don't care right. where it is, <laughs> right? I mean, it's bars, it's stone walls, and your freedom is taken away. And em empathy, again, you're tuning in to what it must have been like to be those inmates. I another thing was we we hear a lot about is um, old um, psych wards, uh, mental institutions. Uh, have you ever had a chance to go at night, or you know, like mostly? I probably would want to go during the day, but <laughs> at night in, into one of these old facilities that maybe is even closed down now. How was that? How was that? And how was that feeling? Yeah, no, that's kind of my thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, there's one place. Uh, <laughs> so for the last 12 years, I've also my day job has been working for the show Ghost Adventures right. and as a writer and researcher. So in season two of the show, we started working on a place called Penhurst Asylum uh, right in Spring City, Pennsylvania, sort of near Philadelphia down there in the corner. And uh, when I first started working on it, I thought, OK, asylums and asylum. The stories are so similar between all of them. These great facilities were built. People were treated really great and humanely. They were getting better. They lived as good functional lives. Right. Funding sank. <laughs> Conditions got overcrowded. I mean, this story just repeats, right? All across the nation, all around the world, really. Penhurst was so bad that there's now a federal law called the Penhurst Law about how you can and can't treat people with mental disabilities because of atrocities that took place inside these buildings. And <laughs> I spoke to, and this was the 1970s, by the way. 1970s not too far. like yeah. not the dark ages not you know and so um i mean patients were kept in dog kennels because they they oh were just God. wild and they didn't have the, the people to take care of them uh if you bit someone more than once they pulled your teeth out so you couldn't bite oh people anymore God. and then just it was horrible like absolutely horrible there it is penhurst asylum so uh this place is just one of those you, you can't forget it the first time i walked inside I just got this this feeling of sadness and while being inside of there we went down below there's tunnels that connect some of the many buildings and i'm down there and i, I was actually with zach and with my friend dave schrader and we're getting ready to film at night and we hear this like laughter way deep in the distance in this tunnel and then this cold blast of air just goes whoosh, right by us and we just looked at each other and my thought was like this building wants to talk hmm. And, and I mean that, like, it's got something to tell us and something to teach us, right? Because if we tell this story, if we hold up this mirror to America and say, look, it ain't always pretty, maybe there won't be another Penhurst in the future, right? Maybe, I mean, these are the least of our people. We have to take care of them. If, right. we, not, if we don't, who will? Uh, these are people's, you know, children and brothers and sisters and cousins and so on. And they were treated worse than you would ever treat an animal. So I think sometimes a place is haunted because it should be. And Penhurst is definitely one of those places. Like you said, to be reminded, n to never forget. That's, you know, I, my mom was in a nursing home and, you know, definitely it was a VA nursing home and they, you know, they treated them well, but it's it just, I couldn't imagine, you know, the end of your life, it, you know, and that would be your last impression on life. And I'm sure that's why a lot of times, like you say, hauntings, are still around because, you know, it wasn't what they wanted, needed, and thought that their life would end that way. So, and I, I still think though, like, yeah, I, my grandma was in a nursing home and right. last thing in the world she wanted last thing, anybody, nobody right. wants that. Right. right. I mean, no, nobody, you know, um, although I always joke with my mom when she's like, can you help me open this pickle jar? I'm like, you're going in the home. Like that's, <laughs> that's you can't take care of yourself, obviously. Right. Right. Uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your mom's so, calling uh, you in about no, 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I think that, that, that guilt is ours, right? right? Like that's, they're gone. They're not staying around there. That's not where they're going to haunt. They're free right. now, but that guilt uh, eats at us and haunts us. Like, Oh, could I have taken, could I have quit my job and taken care of, mom or grandma at home or could i have done this or could i have done that and those are the things that literally haunt us and i think we, we just kind of like call up this impression call up the spirit of them um because we, we all wrestle with those things right how do you live your own life how do you respect the past respect each other and then you know not be haunted right. and I, I um david bowie i'm a big fan 
I once heard him say that he writes songs and music to deal with his ghosts, hmm. not his demons, his ghosts. And his point was, if I deal with them while they're ghosts, then they don't become demons. demons. Wow. And that's I was like, oh, powerful. that's so profound, man. And it, it fits all of us. He's just talking about writing songs. I'm talking about living life. Same story, though. And I think uh, you're actually bringing up a great point. I mean, you know, these people are like, aren't we talking about the, the, the book? But the thing is, it's, it really is. We can learn a lot from, like you said, the ghost past. If we just do the research, you know, the asylums, the house, the Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dahmer's, you know, victims or whoever, whoever it is, we can actually learn a lot about um, how we should live our life or live it up to the fullest or something like that. I so, totally forgot we were talking about the book. I know. <laughs> no, it's good. No, it's the, no, this it's is, great. This, this I mean, is, it's funny, this though, because like, I, you know, we to me, like this is bigger, right? It's when I first started, I'm like, ooh, ghost stories, like. Right. But I found so much more meaning in them over the right. years that, that it's just so much more than just knocks on the wall and 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 tales that give you chills. It's those two. And by all means, like, have fun with it. Sit around the campfire, make some s'mores. Let's tell those stories. But to me, like, th it's just so much bigger and means so much more and can actually, like, help us and, and, and maybe, maybe save the world, Tony. It's my sincere hope. The right ghost story will right. save us all. Well, you know, and, and you had a life-changing experience that made you write this next book. Yeah. And uh, it, like I said, how does it tie in to, you know, all your books you've written on ghosts and hauntings and stuff like that? So The Call of Kilimanjaro, um, tell us how this book relates to what you have been writing about and what inspired you to do this. So Mount Kilimanjaro, um, I sort of first heard about it in the 80s thanks to the toto song by africa I right sure is song. kilimanjaro rises like olympus africa. above the serengeti so i always had this like neat fascination with africa in college i took two semesters of swahili which is kind of a long story that we don't have to get into but swahili is the language of east africa and my mom's like when are you ever going to use that and i'm right. like oh you never know um <laughs> So I, I and I and I like mountains. I've been a hiker since uh, college. I, I live in New England. I hike the White Mountains, and and I love um, getting away from it all and and doing all that. Who so doesn't? Kilimanjaro had been on my bucket list for years, and then a few years ago, 2013, my brother-in-law got cancer, and he was uh, at the time he was 44, oh, and wow. young, and 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 it was one of these. One of these cancers that, um, you know, he was losing weight and then they ran some tests and one day his doctor calls him at work and says, come down here right now. Don't make an appointment. Don't wait for the end of the day. Stop whatever you're doing and get hmm. down here. And he knows like that's not good. Right. And he learns he had stage four cancer, fully oh metastasized, and he's got 18 to 24 months to live. Wow. And he and I got a lot closer during that uh, those two years right and so yeah, we, we yeah. talked a lot my sister and, and, was in denial she didn't want to talk about it um you know he said i'm gonna fight but in reality he just sunk into a deep depression and i'm not judging i don't know how i would face a, a death sentence like that but after a while after about a year his condition is getting worse but his mental attitude is getting better and we're talking a lot about this really slow dance with death and he called me and he said look you're into some weird stuff and i said that's <laughs> totally fair and he said, I'm going through something pretty weird. And I said, that is also totally fair. You know, most of us, death is supposed to be a surprise. You know, you go to bed one night and you don't wake up. You have a heart right. attack. It's over. Right. Car accident. Boom. It's, it's done. You're not supposed to see it coming for two years. Like that's, that's a brutal, um, that's a brutal thing to go through. Right. So, so as he got near the end, he was having these out of body experiences where he talked about, um, you know, starting to see things and hmm. so on. And, and he would only talk to me about it because he knew about my background. And so uh, when he got to the very end, you know, we, we talked about these, this deeply spiritual thing that he was going through. And this, this guy was practically an atheist when I met him. Oh, and wow. near the end, he was just this like golden being of light, just no, no anger to anybody, just, just at peace with everything that was happening. 46 years old, which is the age I am right now. He's and old. I went to see him and uh, this was his last days, right? And we spoke for hours about how uh, these out-of-body experiences he was having all day long now. And I said, what do you think it means? 
And he said, I think there's something inside this broken machine that's getting ready to, to wiggle out and stay out. Hmm. And I went, wow. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And then he passed away. And, um, my, my nephew was five years old at the time. And my sister of course was a mess about it. And he and I got, got real close at the end. Six months later, I was at a paranormal event and a woman from the Leukemia and Lymph Lymphoma Society said, hey, Jeff, we got this fundraiser going on. I did this light the night walk for them once where uh, we walked like two miles down right. downtown Worcester, Massachusetts and raised like a thousand bucks for uh, blood fight blood cancer. And uh, so I was like, oh, Amy, I'm super busy, but if I can help, I'll help. And no, no, no. She's like, we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money for fighting blood cancer. And I went, what? Right. There it is. Killy. And I said, <laughs> Kilimanjaro, the one that I've been thinking about since childhood, the one that's been on my bucket list. I just lost my brother-in-law who is not that much older than me months ago to cancer and I can raise money for cancer. And, wow. I, and I was just like, yeah, I'm in. And I trained and I raised money for leukemia lymphoma society. And uh, I transformed my body. And for like a good almost year, I was so singularly focused on this huge task. 19,341 feet and uh, one of the seven summits, the highest summit on the whole continent of Africa. And we get out there, it's six days to get to the top, two days to get down. Oh and it was, <laughs> I, I mean, I figured it would be a powerful experience, but I had no idea just how powerful, uh, physically transformative, spiritually transformative. Each day as you get up into thinner and thinner air, you, you know, the Maasai people say that the summit of Kilimanjaro is a place that uh, only God dwells and only those deemed worthy are allowed to go there. And by the time we were trying to make for the summit on the last night, uh, we start at midnight and you go from 15,000 feet to 19,000 feet. And it is so hard to breathe. It's hard to describe. The best analogy I can give you is go take a drinking straw, right. put it in your mouth and, and just through breathe it. through that. And now sprint down the street and try to keep enough air. And it's just that, you know, desperate for air. And it was so cold. And I'm a New England guy, man. I can handle the cold. You're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> it was as cold as it's ever been. And it's as dark as it's ever been. That's Chris. I'm holding a picture of Chris right there. And as we get higher and higher up, uh, I, I'm like, I can't do this. I mean, I just, I didn't, I'm like, I got to turn back. And then I just saw this little sliver of light on the horizon. And I remember thinking, all right, the sun's coming. Sunrise is coming. Let me just push a little higher. By the time the sun broke through we were right at the rim of the volcano about oh 18,800 feet a place called Stella Point and I saw this sunrise and Tony I will never forget the feeling I felt the presence of creator God whatever label you want to use I felt judged and I felt deemed worthy and I mm. knew in that instant even though the summit was still another 500 vertical feet and another like 45 minutes away it's a done deal I knew I would make it right there I felt Chris next to me oh my and it gosh, was so wow. deeply spiritual. Um, and, and it, it changed everything, right? It changed. Yeah. So there's still a point. And then you can see it kind of goes around and that's the summit is up off to the right there. And, uh, you know, once by the, the summit was, was almost anticlimactic, you know I mean? It was great. It's like the trophy for right. <laughs> playing, but, but, <laughs> um, the big moment was seeing that sunrise and feeling that mm. connected in a place that, you know, there's no life, there's no bugs, there's no plants, it's there's nothing grows up there. It's just you and this, this mountain. And it was just absolutely spiritual, transformative, and I can close my eyes right now and go right back there. And I'll never forget it. And I, I came back and I just started writing. And I wanted to try to capture that I took 1600 photos so the book's full of <laughs> full of pictures yeah everything was a man tony everywhere you look i'm sure you're just like oh my god look at that oh my god look at that and and i i'm one of those people that's so goal oriented like i just want to get to the top and i bought a really good camera for, throughout my training and i said i want to learn to slow down and taking photos was part of my way to do that was to say like well i if i'm going to document this I have to slow down. I have to appreciate right. the the little tiny beauty of the, you know, getting up close, the big beauty of these incredible, you know, views that go out for endless miles. And, uh, and it forced me to really look at the world and look at myself. And I feel like I came back a, a different man. 
It's 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 this. I guess we can make this up, but it's death helped you live. Of course, and and I I mean you know there's that cheesy country song right, live like you're dying, and it's it's cheese, but man, it's it's true. You know, you listen to it and you go, yeah, I get it. Mm. Uh, that you know, you start asking like, well, what what do I still want to accomplish? What do I I don't want to leave things on the table here. You know, the the I don't know how long I have. What if what if I get that call from the doctor saying, right. hey man, something's wrong? Um, you never know. You have no idea, and so. I, I want to have adventures. I want to find great stories, tell great stories and, and make sure my own story is something that's worth reading. Well, we just have a few minutes left and I can't believe it's already been 45 minutes. And, uh, but the, we'll have to have you back this and people in, uh, Timothy in the chat room said, God bless you. You're a man of great courage and inspiration for, for those struggling with the loss of a loved one. So, uh, well, thank you. It's, it's, I'm sure this book will, you know, you know, all the other books have been entertaining, and, and but this one I think is going to be more entertaining, but it's also going to be an inspiration. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, it's funny, Tony. Like, I mean, I've always written other people's stories, right? right. Like, you tell me about your ghost experience, and right. I write it, and I research the history, and I love that, and I will continue to do that. However, man, this is as naked as I've ever been, right? This is my story. This is deeply personal. And so, uh, you know, look, I read the Amazon. I read all my Amazon reviews. Of course I do. Like, you know, well, every author I do. know does that. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes people say mean things in there and, you know, you, you let it roll off, but I'm telling you right now, folks, one mean thing on this book and I'm going to cry like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to, right, right. I'll put on a brave face, but man, it's going to hurt because this is deeply personal. Well, people are better not, or you got to deal with <laughs> Tony Sweet. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah. uh, tell people you have your podcast uh, and tell uh, every, how to get a hold of you, listen to you, all that good stuff. Yeah. So the weekly podcast is called New England Legends. It's super short, like 10 to 12 minutes is, is an episode. Once a week, uh, we just it's it's a, a scripted with voice actors and music and sound effects. Just one weird story from somewhere in New England uh, every single week. And we're doing that for three years wow. and it's free anywhere you get podcasts. You can subscribe for free. And that's been a lot of fun. Uh, my website's jeffbelander.com. I'm currently on a story tour, a virtual story tour doing these zoomy things. Uh, yeah. every single night where I, I show some of the places I've been, there's pictures, I tell stories and because I'm stuck at home, like everybody else, right. I'm actually changing the program every single night. So Wonderful. it's like a band that knows a hundred songs and each night I'm going to play 10 and tomorrow will be a different 10. And, and he sings um, too. Yeah. And it's, it's just been, it's been, um, you know, on the one hand, it's great because I'm, I'm reaching more people and, uh, it's intimate. I'm in their homes instead of in a building, but right man, I miss seeing faces because I, I do this every year and I miss being in spaces with people and being able to give hugs and shake hands and all that other stuff. But this is the next best thing. So this is what we're doing. Well, we appreciate you and uh, you're going to come back in March Yes, <laughs> for the please. release of the book because the this book actually does not even get released until March, right? That's right. And I, I can send you tons of photos if you want to show them while we're talking. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, I, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. It's, it's, uh, I mean, Tony, this is a place that like, I mean, I promise you, I will go back. I will do that mountain again. Like this, when I got the, the minute I got down before I even showered after like over a week, you know, I was like, <laughs> oh, there's no way I'm going to go the rest of my life and not do that again. I yeah. just, uh, I'm scared of heights, so I don't know if I could do it, but, uh, I, I, I <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that's a that's a, a would be a challenge for me. People trying to get me to jump out of an airplane, I'm like, hell no. Yeah, so maybe yeah, maybe I did that too. Yeah, say rub it in. I did because it, it scared me. It's the only I did it once because it scared me. And um, yep, uh, uh, never forget it. I'll, I'll I'll enjoy it through your vision. So, uh, <laughs> Fair enough. well, everybody, thank you for tuning in. For truth be told, uh, Jeff is uh, one of our alumni, and uh, like a, he's a good friend of ours now, and uh, he's been for a couple of years now. And uh, so, make sure you check him out. Check out his podcast, everything he's doing. Get his books and support him. It's important that uh, we keep this these legends going. And uh, until next time, I'm Tony Sweet on Truth Be Told. We're out of here. Take care. Bye.